So one thing I really wanted to talk about is last year, Sam, in 2023, the Giants and the Vikings had nearly identical seasons, except I think the Vikings had a little more talent than we did last year. Um, the Vikings, they were 6-4 and four at one point after starting 0-4. Oh they lost Kirk Cousins to a season-ending injury. The Giants lost Daniel Jones to a season-ending injury. And let's be honest, Sam, these teams met in the playoffs in 2022. They were two of the best seven teams in the NFC. I'll say six because Seattle really shouldn't have made the playoffs, in my personal opinion, but they did. Um, they, both these teams need to get back on track. Both their head coaches are entering year three in Brian Dable and Kevin O'Connell. And a lot of people, I know, Sam, you and I have probably both been seeing this. They expect a ugly, sloppy game between these two teams. And I'm going to be honest with you. I see it because Sam Darnold's returning to MetLife. There are a lot of factors in this game that in my personal opinion, work against the Minnesota Vikings. And that's one of them. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Cause you know, this was, this is the one playoff game that Daniel Jones won. It's like, that's, that's pretty exciting on paper to think about that, you know, the Vikings, but obviously not this Vikings team is a completely different Vikings team. And in fact, it's a more vulnerable Vikings team, obviously without Kirk cousins and without JJ McCarthy and Sam Darnold stepping in and maybe there's feelings in MetLife or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, this game, you know, I've gone back and forth in my head and I was just speaking, you know, with Jordan before this, while we did our podcast is sporty. Jordy is our resident Eagles fan on this show. And um, she was saying, like, wow, like, that's actually an interesting game because it really could go either way. You know, it's like one of those good starting games, you know, like last year it was like the Cowboys and we were we just came in there swinging and we were like, we're going to win. And then we got blown out completely. Um, but, yeah, I am actually feel like this is a really great starting matchup. Um with the Minnesota Vikings, like, yes, they have Justin Jefferson, and he is one of the best wide receivers in the league, uh, probably going to be one of the best wide receivers of all time. It just, you know, it's a little scary in that respect, but Sam Darnold definitely turns it down a little bit. So it's I, – I keep going back and forth in my head about it, but I, I think I've made my decision, and we'll talk about it when we do our prediction, obviously, for the game. A lot of factors going into this week, folks. And if you have any comments and questions for us as we preview this week one matchup, please ask. We'd be happy to converse with you and answer them. And we appreciate you all tuning in. So quick notes, Giants have been very busy behind the scenes. They've let go of a lot of players via injury settlements. Isaiah McKenzie being one of them, he did not make the roster over Gunnar Olszewski. There was a time, Sam, where I thought McKenzie would make it over Olszewski, and Olszewski's been moving very gingerly in practice. But when they talked to special teams coordinator Mike Gobriel today, new special teams coordinator coming over from the Jets, um, they seemed pretty optimistic on Gunner's availability. He was limited, and he really talked about securing the football. So if Gunner does play, you got to remember, too, only 48 guys are dressing. Two will be called up from the practice squad. Um, and they'll be playing along with the 46. But Olszewski has a chance to play. I think he's a decent returner. Um, they also terminated Miles Boykin from the practice squad, and I think that goes to show, folks, how well Bryce Ford Wheaton played this preseason, who, being a UDFA out of West Virginia last year, suffered a season-ending injury in the preseason. I was very impressed to see Ford Wheaton make the roster. I did not think he was going to make it. And uh, okay, Ford Wheaton knew he was making it because uh, he acknowledged me in one of my posts online. Yeah, I, I saw that. that. I don't know if you saw that. And I'm yeah. like, please don't hate me, kid. I think you are good. But coming off an injury, I thought they might go elsewhere with a more experienced player. Um, and, yeah, Brian Dable announces he'll be the offensive play caller this year. So that's pretty much what's been going on. Big change, I think. Huge. I think it's going to make a huge difference, and I think week one 
we will be seeing this different Giants team, even if it's not like, you know, exponentially better. I think that, you know, Kafka no longer calling plays is, is going to make a difference for us. Absolutely. Um, it's going to be very interesting. The Vikings are favored by one and a half in this game. They went three and zero in the preseason. They'll be at MetLife. The last meeting, we know what happened there. The Giants won the NFC Wild Card Playoff game in 2022. But before that, the Vikings had won four straight against Big Blue, and they still lead the all-time series 18 to 13. And I brought this note up last year. I don't want to bring it up again, but I'm going to. The Giants have just won two games to start the season since 2010, one of them being 2022, the other time 2016. Sam, both of those years they made the playoffs. So when the Giants win a week one game since 2010, they're making the playoffs. How important is it to get out to a 1-0 start compared to an 0-1 start? Everyone's always like, oh, it's one game. But to the Giants, sometimes it makes or breaks everything. It usually sets the tone for our entire season. And I think last year is a great example of that, seeing us get blown out by the the Cowboys. And then, you know, the the way that the rest of that season just unfolded was just like so, so garbage. Um, Except for like that one game where we were playing the Bills and I think Tyrod Taylor was playing. I was so excited watching that game. It was we were so close to winning. But nonetheless, a hundred percent. I think, especially for this team, morale will be so much higher if we win that first game. Yes, of course, it'll be against Sam Darnold. You know, it's not going to be like this all-time team. You know, it's not like we're going up against the Chiefs and winning Week One. But I definitely think morale will be so much higher. Fans will feel really good about it. People will probably on Twitter will go off the rails and think, you know all of a sudden the the Giants are going to the Super Bowl, which they're not. But it's just, I would feel much more comfortable with a win week one and a week week and a win week two. Why not? Let's throw that into the mix. Let's win week two as well. It's it, It'll really change the the name of the game. And then, of course, people will be talking like, oh, is Daniel Jones better? Oh, is the, the play calling is getting better? And this and that and the other thing. So the narrative will change. Absolutely. I, I think it will too. And – Speaking of Daniel Jones, that sort of leads us into our keys of the game. And my most important key of this game is building off of how the offensive line has looked in the preseason, protecting Daniel Jones. You know, every time somebody says Daniel Jones had a shitty year last year, sure, you're right. But at the same time, the Giants O-line last year was historically bad. 85 sacks given up amongst all three quarterbacks that played. That's the second most all time in any season, in any team's history. Um, Jones was sacked 30 plus times, 30 times in five plus games. That's six sacks a game. That's horrible. I mean, that's absolutely horrendous, atrocious. Um, And what is concerning too, and they both sort of joked about this last week. He took a picture of the starting five offensive linemen this year because that was the first time they played in practice together was about a week and a half ago was the first time all five were healthy ready to go because John Michael Schmitz was nursing a shoulder injury this off season and that limited him too. And that's another guy who has to be much better this year entering year two, Sam. Yeah. I was devastated when John Michael Schmitz was not playing last year because he was um, like the way that Jermaine is like the piece of the puzzle this year. I thought John Michael Smith was going to be like the piece of the puzzle last year, you know, getting that center. And I really wish that he had a little bit more on the field, um, you know, time last year, but I am still very confident in him. And I think that it's going to be such a big change. This God, this offensive line, I feel like is going to change everything. Um, but John Michael Smith, you know, having that, good center makes a difference and it really affects the quarterback and you know he's going he's going into sophomore year now right he was drafted last year okay and you know obviously you shake off those rookie jitters despite coming off an injury you've learned more you've seen more it's time to get in there and start leading that offensive line and and really you know 
making sure that that becomes a brick wall because Lord knows we need it. I second that. What's up, goofballs? How are you? What up, everybody? Uh, good podcast, by the way. Make sure to go check them out. We still have to do that collaboration with you guys. We'd love to do that at some point this season. So we'll definitely uh, be in contact with each other for sure. Um, share some good laughs. Um, yeah, to your point, Andrew Thomas has to stay healthy. Mm-hmm. Jermaine Illuminor has to stay healthy because Minnesota's pass rush is no joke. Dallas Turner, first round pick after McCarthy. Obviously, they lost JJ McCarthy for the season, and that stinks because I thought he was going to have a really good rookie year. Not mm-hmm. the case now. Um, Dallas Turner. Jonathan Greenard from Houston last year had 12 and a half sacks there. The Vikings bring in him to replace Daniel Hunter. And Andrew Van Ginkle signed as well from the Miami Dolphins had six and a half sacks last year. So it's interesting to see because that pass rush is lethal, Sam. But I think if the O-line holds enough, that secondary is very, very vulnerable. You have older veterans back there like Stephon Gilmore, who they just signed. Harrison Smith is 34 years old now. Their two safeties were the leading tacklers last year. Each of their safeties at over 100 tackles. So if you get past their front seven, they could really be exposed, which is why I think Malik Neighbors will have a big game. Yeah, I agree. I agree with everything you said. I think that, you know, I I said it earlier, but this Vikings team is not as strong as it would have been. Um, and it's, it's a bit vulnerable, which is good for us because then it means that we can latch on to that vulnerability and make plays out of it because otherwise, you know, I would be a little nervous going into this, to this week, but yeah. Yeah. Um, it's going to be very, very interesting. Sam, for you, what are you thinking as your key to the game? What must the giants accomplish? I know you've kind of touched upon certain points throughout the show, but how do they get to want to know? I think that, you know, oh man, there's so many things. It's like, it's hard trying to pick one, but I definitely think that the offense gluing together and, and, you know, molding into a singular offense is probably one of the biggest things to go into this week. You know, it's to come out, swinging strong to show, yes, we can get down the field. Yes, we can score points, you know, which has obviously been a huge issue for us. Apparently these past few years, like just can't put points on the board. You know, it's, this is a brand new team. And I think that that's going to be the best thing is molding this offense. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to watch this offensive line. I think that's a, instead of picking one player to watch, I think I'm going to pick all of them. I think I'm just going to pick this entire offensive line to, to keep an eye out for. And of course, Daniel Jones, you know, it's, it's kind of all on his shoulders right now. And yes, I know it's a team sport, but at the same time, you know, it all, it all comes down to him. Yeah. This season is clearly riding on him. Um, I I think what will help him too is, you got to win in the trenches. You know, Dexter Lawrence is scary, you know, occupies two defenders um, going up against Garrett Brad- Bradbury, their center. You know, the Vikings have four O-line returners this year from last year. So their O-line is in a lot better place than ours as far as continuity goes. So for our sake, hopefully the Giants can gel. Hopefully those four guys can be in sync um, or those five guys, I should say, and it's going to be interesting, too, with John Michael Schmitz going up against former Bill, now Viking, Harrison Phillips, who had 93 tackles last year for Minnesota. Knows a lot about Brian Dable's offense. Um, obviously, Justin Jefferson is a huge problem for any team, not just our team, but Deontay Banks and Justin Jefferson, for me, that's the matchup to watch on Sunday, folks. Can Banks hold his ground? Because I don't know about you, Sam, I thought Banks had a very good – rookie season there were struggles at times but i'm concerned about a potential sophomore slump for him yeah it's there are guys like that 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 have those really big breakout seasons and then they come into this next following year and it's really not as much as we thought it was going to be 
I really hope that doesn't happen. Banks was someone that I think really surprised us last year, and we were, like, super stoked about him. Um, I'd really hope that, no, that doesn't happen. But now that you say it, ugh, now it's going to sit in my brain. Yeah, I it, it's possible. It's very possible. But, you know, we hope for the best. And, Sam, I know you highlighted some players to watch already. You know, Daniel Jones and the entire offensive mm-hmm. line. Um, I think Daniel Bellinger, too, is going to be very important, in the, not just in this game, but in this season. Um, he's back to tight end one. 2022 as a rookie, he was tight end one. Last year, he took a back seat to Waller. And I know you're a Bellinger fan, as am I. Um, what are your expectations for him this season? I think that I have – pretty high expectations for Daniel Bellinger, actually. I think that, you know, he's had this time to grow. He's now also sat behind a veteran in Darren Waller, despite him being a little strange, as we've realized this past year. And, you know, we didn't even talk about Darren Waller, but um, he's no longer with us. Uh, I don't think we have time to unpack all of Darren Waller's stuff right now. Um, But, (laughs) yeah, it'd be a whole Darren Waller show. But, you know, Still, you know, Darren Waller, despite it all, you know, he was he's a good tight end. So I'm sure there was things that Bellinger learned from him. But I'd like to think that he's he's gathered the knowledge that he needs. And now as a tight end one, he can step up and be the guy that I was expecting him to be in like his rookie year. You know, I put I think I put these high expectations on him like the second he got on the team. Um but I, I think that's going to be great. I think that he's going to, you know, he's going to be a big target for Daniel. Obviously, you know, they've been together these last few years. And it's, this is his third year now, right? Okay. I'm, I'm like still trying to like, sorry guys, I'm like dusting off the, the Giants and football cobwebs right now, getting into week one. But yeah, it's um, Daniel, Daniel Bellinger, I think my expectations for him are high. And if he's not reaching those expectations, then it might be time to consider looking for a tight end in the off season. Um, Cause it's a big deal for us. And he, they're another position that we really haven't had like a exponentially good, you know, player in that mm-hmm. position, you know, Evan Ingram went back and forth for so long, but you know, He's doing well now on the Jags, but he just didn't mesh well on our on our team. So, you know, that's another player that, like, he needs to step up to the plate now and be tight end one in the same way that Malik Neighbors is trying to step up to be wide receiver one. I agree. Um, I think, too, Theo Johnson's going to be heavily involved in this offense. Fourth-round rookie tight end out of Penn State. Um, he's going to be very involved. I think you're going to see a lot of 12 personnel this year, but – Guys, week one, Bellinger is tight end one, and I think having Theo Johnson, a younger guy, looking up to Daniel Bellinger, who's only entering year three, which is crazy to say, and then Chris Manhurt stuck around as the blocking tight end, and I'll be honest, Sam, I wanted the Giants to keep four tight ends, not three. Um, Our fourth tight end, I mentioned earlier in the show, I started alluding to it, but I didn't mention it, wound up getting claimed back by the Philadelphia Eagles. Jack Stoll, who played every snap of the Giants' final preseason game against the the Jets. Joe Shane signs him to a one-year deal this spring, spends the summer with us, heads back down the turnpike, gives all the information to the Eagles that he learned from the Giants. He's a spy, hired as a spy by Nick Sirianni and Howie. Love it. Not surprising Um, at all on the Eagles' part. Nope. Uh, Kevin? Saying, let's go Giants. Let's go Big Blue, Kevin. Thank you very much for the comment. For me, for the Vikings, um, I'm looking at Aaron Jones. We haven't really talked about him yet. New running back for them this year. He'll split time with Ty Chandler. But Jones spent his first six years, uh, six to seven years with the Packers. He's older now. Good pass catcher and a runner. Had 650 yards last season on the ground. I like him a lot. Um, We also have to consider, too, Jordan Addison had 10 touchdowns as a rookie last year, and the rumor is he'll be ready to go. He had over 900 yards and 10 scores. He was forced to step up because Justin Jefferson only played 10 games. You know, Jefferson's an obvious catapult of this offense, but when you're looking at players to watch, I'm looking more at, like, players that – 
might catch you off guard a little bit. And right now, the Giants' CB2 position, we don't even know who's starting week one. And we're four days out. That's yeah. not good. No. So I think Addison's going to feast because mm. Banks will clearly be on Jefferson. I don't know if Flott's going to play. And then we have a rookie slot guy. You know, Darnay's not on the team anymore. So I don't know what's going to happen there. I'm very, very concerned about that, Sam. I think Jordan Addison's probably going to have a really good game. Um, you know, a couple deep plays maybe or intermediate catches. And it gets me a little bit concerned. They had an opportunity to sign Stephon Gilmore. They didn't. Um you know, cash is not as tight for the Giants as we thought it was after Waller retired and they restructured Andrew Thomas and Dexter Lawrence. So, you know, there's some wiggle room and they kind of just left it fluid for the season, which I get it, but Dory Jackson better be good. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> is Jordan, Jordan Addison is for sure playing um, this weekend? The last I heard he was playing. Because I he thought was- he was getting suspended. Unless that just fell through. He said he was limited in Wednesday's Vikings practice. I think the suspension, the alleged suspension, got dropped. Okay. Yeah, because I was, like, just looking up some articles, and I'm like, no, I'm not seeing them. Right. And that they were from, like, a month ago. But yeah. DUI. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Two but misdemeanors. Aaron Jones was someone that I was going to bring up when we were talking more Vikings um, because – I feel like he's going to be kind of like the sneaky offensive weapon on this team. You know, obviously, yes, of course, we have Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison, but, you know, we're, we're dealing with Sam Darnold here. And if I were him and I don't want to make myself look like as bad of a quarterback as I have in the past, like I'm passing the ball off, you know, that, that is a, you know, a very easy play call to do where you're just like, Oh, yep. Give it to Aaron. Oh, yep. Give it to Aaron. And Aaron will nickel and dime this defense. I'm hoping that the defense will see something along those lines and be prepared for it and be able to stop the run. Um, I'll throw that in there as another key to the game. Stop the run. Um, But yeah, I think Aaron Jones is going to be a little bit sneaky on this Vikings team um, only because of the quarterback that they have right now. Great player. Uh, Always liked him. Um, And defensively for Minnesota, I'm going to roll with Ivan Pace Jr. The Vikings have revamped their linebacker room. You know, Eric Kendricks went to the Chargers last offseason. You know, they signed Blake Cashman from the Houston Texans to join Ivan Pace Jr. But Pace had 102 tackles last year. He'll be on that second level. Um, really helping out Harrison Smith and that back line. They need better linebackers. They didn't have that last year. They were going with older players like Jordan Hicks. It just wasn't cutting it. And, you know, having an elder statesman in the secondary like Stephon Gilmore, who's 33 now, you know, you want to have good linebackers that are going sideline to sideline and pace playing in that Cincinnati Bearcats defense for four years. He's very fast. He's physical. He's aggressive. And another thing, too, I threw Blake Cashman in there. Him and Devin Singletary were teammates last year. So there's a connection there that is definitely a little concerning. And, Sam, I did want to talk a little bit about Devin Singletary because I think he's going to be really good for us. I like him a lot. Nickname the motor. I know. I saw that on Hard Knocks, and I was like, who's the motor? And they were talking about Devin Singletary. Apparently that's what people call him. But, yeah, I think that – you know, Devin Singletary is is our new Saquon Barkley, basically. And, you know, it's kind of what a comparison that is. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, we need a strong running back. And Devin, Devin Singletary, I feel, he's been around for a while. Like, he is a seasoned running back. And I'm pretty sure his injury list is pretty short. I, I can't really remember any time where Devin Singletary was so hurt to the point of it, just, you know, affecting his career in any way um but yeah i'm like i said i have him on my bench in my fantasy team just in case he starts running amok because you know otherwise we have tyro uh yeah tyrone tracy and eric gray like Mm -hmm. those guys yes while you know they'll they'll prove to be helpful in terms of depth like 
Devin Singletary is our running back. Like he is our guy. So hopefully they feed him and he he takes off because it's he he's he's our guy. You want to hear this stat, Sam, about Singletary? Oh boy. Since since 2019, he's only missed one game due to injury. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm like, I don't remember Devin Singletary ever getting hurt exponentially. So, yeah. I mean, that's a great track record for a running back. Yeah. Like, pretty good. Now, granted, our offensive line last year was much different from Houston's, but Singletary had 898 rushing yards last year. Saquon had 962. Mm. That's that's like a 90-yard difference for $8 million less per year. So you guys do the math and they're the same age. It's pretty interesting. Actually, yeah. I think Saquon's a year older than him. Yes. Yes, he is. Um, I think Singletary just turned 27. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Late, late birthday. But yeah, Saquon's a bit older. Look, I wish Saquon nothing but the best. It's going to be weird on Thank Sunday you. to see a running back wearing 26 in our backfield, not named Saquon. It sucks, but it's reality. Yeah, reality. unfortunate. But I, I, I agree. You, you telling me that that injury stat and us talking about it right now has me uh, a little bit more on the positive side of Devin Singletary because, you know, at this point though he has to be good. I think that's it. I think it's like we have no other option than for De Devin Singletary to be a good running back for us. Now, Sam, is there anyone else on the Vikings that we're watching on Sunday? They do have a rookie kicker out of Alabama, but you know who knows. Oh. I mean, I we we're hitting a lot of people, um, but yeah, I think that those are those are the main guys here. Yeah, um, I do want to acknowledge. Lastly, their tackles: uh, Brian O'Neill and Christian Darisaw going up against Brian Burns and Kayvon Thibodeau. That's another very highly intense matchup. The Giants struggled to get to the quarterback last year, despite their number one blitz frequency in the NFL. So, yeah, Shane Bowen notorious for stopping the run and relying much more on his front four to get pressure. So that'll definitely be interesting. Um, anyone on the defense? I know Brian Burns, obviously we have to highlight him because he's a dog. He's really, really good. And I liked what I saw from him in preseason. I'll definitely say Brian Burns, but I got to throw in my guy, Bobby O. I we love Bobby O. I actually had the privilege of meeting him back in February in Vegas when I was at the Super Bowl. Uh, my boss introduced me to him and he was like, This is our producer. She's a Giants fan. She loves you. And I was like, Oh my God. Hi, Bobby. How are you? His hands are like two of mine. He has very, very large hands and he's a very, very kind guy. So I'm going to shout out Bobby O because also just an animal on the field. Like, amazing. Um, I envy you. That's awesome. Um, Bobby O is the best free agent signing we've had, yeah. arguably, arguably since Plexico Burris. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Um, there are another few mentions, but yeah, for me, Bobby O, um, Again, TJ Hawkinson is out. He's on the pup list, so we won't have to worry about him. Josh Oliver and Johnny Munt will be splitting the reps at tight end, so we'll see how they do on that second level. Um, Mike McFadden is nursing a groin injury, but he's trending upwards towards playing. That's good because the entire linebacker room was hurt in the preseason. Um Carter Coughlin missed the whole preseason with an injury and still made the roster. I think we all knew Carter Coughlin was making it. I think it was, I think it was Caitlin Brower asked if Carter Coughlin was still on the team. She totally forgot about him. I'm like, he's still there because I was doing who's left from the Gettleman era. That's still on this oh, team. Oh, but you're keep, you're still keeping that list. I know you are. It, the list is back up to nine because they signed a Dory again. But I have the list here if you want to hear it. So it's hit me with it. Daniel Jones, obviously, Andrew Thomas, Casey Kreider, Graham Gano, Aziz Ojolari, Darius Slayton, Carter Coughlin. That's it. I feel like Aziz is Dexter Lawrence. Oh, Dexter. Aziz, 
do you think he's going to stay on that list much longer? So rumor was he – there was rumors of him possibly getting traded on cut down day. I wonder if that will pick up steam again during the season, depending on how he plays, because he is on a contract year. I wouldn't be surprised. I remember last year you were even talking about how disappointed you were watching him. You were expecting a lot more. I like him too a lot. I know. Which sucks, but I'm going to be a realist and say this is probably his last year as a giant unless he does something miraculous this year. Mm -hmm. I agree. Learns how to stay on the field, but yeah. And then other than that, the injury report's pretty clean. I think everyone that's questionable is expected to play except for maybe Drew Locke. I'm not sure um, with the abdomen that he suffered in week one of the preseason. Right. And then there's Olszewski, who battling a groin. He's moving very gingerly. I'm surprised they're thinking he's going to play. I mean, that by, that might just be smoke. I don't know. Um, and then there's Dane Belton with the back. So I don't know who's going to start at safety, Sam, if it'll be Dane Belton or Tyler Newbin, because obviously right. McKinney is gone. We know Pinnock is one of the incumbents. And Belton was the incumbent as well, but Newbin's been so impressive. The second round pick out of Minnesota, he's looked really good in the offseason. And he might be that Iron Man type of guy that fits Shane Bowen's scheme a little bit more than X would have. But X is another guy I'm gonna miss, but he wasn't worth 17 million a year for his price tag. Yeah. I I, I agree though about um Gunner. Groin injuries are not just like a like a one two three let's walk on the field type of injury like that that takes some nursing because you're constantly walking around anyway so it's like it's hard for you to nurse that back to hell so we'll see what happens. Yeah, um, I think we're ready for our game predictions, which I'm stoked for. <sighs> oh, walking into this again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. All right. Well. It's very, very hard for, I think, for both you and I to go against the Giants going into week one of the season. Um, I am going to say that the Giants beat the Vikings this week. It's going to be incredibly close. I'm going to say 21 to 20 New York Giants. I completely um, agree that it's going to be one of those games where – you kind of ex just expect your team to, to win. And, folks, I'm going to be honest with you. About 95% of Giants content creators this weekend are probably going to pick the Giants. 95% of Vikings content creators are going to pick the Vikings. Um, I'm going to follow that trend but explain why I think the Giants will win this game. It's not just any week one. It's week one of the 100th season. The stadium is going to be rocking. Um, it's going to be the first game back, and the Giants have the Vikings number. They looked really good towards the end of last season when they had Tommy DeVito at quarterback. That last month of the season, Christmas Day, almost coming back against Philly. Um, two oh. weeks later, beating Philly. Yeah. And then the offensive line is in a really good place right now. I really like where the offensive line is at. And the biggest thing for me is, would you rather have Sam Darnold or Daniel Jones? I think the question is clear. I'd rather have Daniel Jones on two left feet than Sam Darnold. Uh, and that's why I'm picking the Giants to win this game 14-13. And Malik Neighbors and Justin Jefferson will offset each other in this game, in my opinion. Everyone's so concerned about Justin Jefferson, but nobody's talking about Malik Neighbors. Like people are like, oh, this is going to be a garbage game. Not many points are going to be scored. Sure, but there's two of the most potentially prolific wide receivers in the NFL playing in this game. People forget about that as well. I have the Giants winning 14, 13, two touchdowns. I think I'm going to go out on a limb and say Malik's going to get one and Singletary's going to get one. Heck yeah. I mm -hmm. love that. I'll throw it in so, there, and I'll say Daniel Bellinger gets one. Okay. I so like what? it. Why not? He did score a touchdown in the 22 playoff game against them on the road. Um, so 
we each have one point wins. Yeah. Like that. Um, lastly, record. <laughs> oh, what all are right. you thinking here? I, I'd like to say that this could go either way. Um, and I will be, um, again, optimistic here because it's hard to go into this just uh, saying, you know, you know, three and 14, like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to guess that. I think that they have the potential to almost split even here. I'm going to go eight and nine. Um, you know, it won't be a winning season, but it'll be a push in the right direction. And whether or not that's with Daniel Jones or not, you know, the offense is growing and this team is growing and the defense is growing. So I think that, you know, they do well enough for themselves and not completely hurt our feelings, but aren't still on the winning side of things. I totally respect that. Um, and I sort of agree with that too. Um, for me, last year, my expectations were a little bit too high. I said mm. 10 and 7, 11 and 6. Um, I think the Giants' floor this year is seven wins, in my personal opinion because the line is better. As long as they stay healthy, they have some very winnable games on their schedule. Carolina in Germany this week, next week, Washington at home. You know, they may get one against Dallas. Who knows? Although Dallas has had our number, so I wouldn't bet on that. Um, they play the NFC South this year, guys. The Saints are not a good football team. Their head coach is on the hot seat. Um, the Atlanta Falcons have Kirk Cousins. But what happens if he goes down? Michael you know, ba <laughs> and I'm sorry, Sam, Baker Mayfield hasn't had – he has not put together two good back-to-back -back seasons since being in the NFL. He's an every-other-year type of guy, and last season was a great season. I can't accept that. <laughs> um, he so beat seven, the Eagles for us in the playoffs. We got to give him that. That he did. Um, he almost got Sirianni fired, though, which would have been a disaster <laughs> um, for That's us because I think they should give him a 10-year extension. Oh, with Sirianni? I know. I, I The worst. I do not. They're not going to win. A, they're not going to win a ring with him. So that's why I keep saying extend him. Please do. Um, seven and 10 is the floor. And I think that's what they are this year. Seven and 10. I want to go low because typically when I go low, folks, they exceed that bar. Um, the optimistic side of me is thinking nine and eight, but seven and 10 is my official record prediction. Um, I just weigh this as one of two things, right? This season weighs on Daniel Jones, staying healthy, staying available and playing good football. And number two, just not having as many injuries as a team that they did last year. This team was decimated via injury and, I'm going to be honest with you. This team lacks depth at some key positions at cornerback. You have to have good cornerbacks in the NFL going up against elite wide receivers. Uh, defensive tackle, there's almost no depth behind Dexter Lawrence. Um, they have good, you know, serviceable players, but nobody that can keep up with the likes of star NFL running backs and O-lines. So in my personal opinion, with all things considered, 7-10, and 10, is the way to go here. That's my prediction. They'll miss the playoffs, but they'll finish in third in the NFC East. Brian Dable will keep his job. I, it's silly to say his job is on the line this year, guys. It's not. Um, he's definitely coming back for year four, unless they go 0-17, which they're not doing that either. But, yeah, that's my re record prediction. Love it. Yep, yep. So without further ado, folks, want to quickly thank everybody for joining us here tonight. It's been a blast. Uh, Sam, I, I'd say you would think the same. We had a lot of fun. A hundred percent. I'm happy to be back. You know, you need, we need this outlet with each other to, to get all our feelings on the Giants out here. It's great to be back. And it's the 100th season of Giants football. There's a lot to be happy about and look forward to um quickly folks if you're new 
joining us tonight, or if you're recurring and I haven't done so yet, please check us out below on all of our social media platforms. We are going to be putting up consistent content this season. You know what we're going to give post game reactions. We're going to do live shows once a week. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot and I'm really excited for it. And I hope you guys are with us for the ride. All right, Sam, it's been a great pleasure tonight doing this show. Appreciate you as always on behalf of Sam Cardona Norberg, I'm Tom Scavetta saying so long. You've been watching Big Blue Avenue here on YouTube and Facebook Live. And without further ado, let's go Big Blue.